morning, everybody, and welcome to our time of worship together on this Sunday, the 5th of April. I'll begin our time of worship by reading from Psalm 118, which says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. In my anguish I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me, and I will not be afraid. With those words, let us just pause for a brief time of prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are with us. No matter where we are watching this today, we know that your presence is amongst us. And as we remember this as Palm Sunday, the day that you entered into Jerusalem, we pray that you would speak to us in a fresh way. In Jesus name. Amen. So I don't know how you've been coping with the lockdown period. I know that it's been nearly 10 days for most of us and as a family we've been getting used to the new normal and it's been going all right so far. But I have to say one of the things that I found the hardest is trying to get my running in. I've been running up and down the driveway trying to get 2k's or 3k's in a day and after a while it leaves me feeling a little bit dizzy and uh, just spinning around in, in some way. And just um, got me thinking about how many of you as my friends, but as the Stormers fans must feel when the Sharks um, play against the Stormers and they make your players run around almost like they're running in circles and uh, the Sharks win yet again. But anyway, let's not talk about rugby today. Um, and rude jokes aside, I hope that the Stormers fans don't uh, tune out now. Please forgive me. But the one thing the lockdown has been teaching me, and I think for many of us, is how busy our lives are and how often we run around in circles, almost like hamsters on the wheel, and end up just making ourselves exhausted, but ending up nowhere. And if you think about that analogy, we come back to the story last week of Lazarus and how Lazarus um, was raised from the dead by Jesus. But the, the fallout of that, if you like, with the religious leaders because this put them into a flat spin. Talk about being dizzy. They were, they were completely um, confused and, and angry at what had happened. For many of these religious leaders, they were afraid of, of losing control now. They were worried about people turning to Jesus. They were worried even about their income in a way. And so for some of the things that they were worried about, I guess we could relate to that today, knowing what's happening around the world with the fallout of the coronavirus. But one of the things that's interesting is that the Pharisees said to themselves in, in secret meetings, they said that we can't let Jesus go on like this. Otherwise, everyone is going to follow him and the Romans are going to take our temple and our nation away. And so they began to plot to kill Jesus. And interestingly, John tells us in verse 53 that from that day on, Jesus also shied away from being in public for a while until we come to today's text. And this in John's uh, Gospel is John chapter 12, verse 12 to 19. It's recorded as Jesus' triumphal entry, entering into Jerusalem. Let me read verse 13. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him. So we've got some palm branches here this morning that can just get us into the mood of this. And some people estimate that the crowd that was gathered in those Passover festivals could have been up to a million people. Now that is almost too amazing to think about. But if you've ever been in a big crowd of people like at a sports game or even at a ticket tape parade, you may know what it's like to be in this huge big gathering of people. Someone um, kind of thought about that with the crowd following Jesus into Jerusalem and the crowd coming out to meet Jesus, it was almost like two waves, two, two tidal waves coming together and, and crashing in the middle. And um, if you've ever been to the beach and you've seen that happen, then you know exactly what, it, what I'm talking about. It's like the wave of Jesus and his disciples coming into Jerusalem and the wave of um, the desires and the purpose of people coming together with God's will and purpose coming together in this cataclysmic moment in the history of the world. 
And we're going to speak about that this morning because as this moment happens, the people take out the palm branches and they start singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And friends, today I want to want to remind us that these aren't just random words. They aren't the mob being stirred up just to shout these random hosannas. They were words of prophecy. In fact, words of, of prayer and, and song that come from the Psalms. Psalm 113 to 118 were a, a section of the Psalms that every Jewish person knew. And they were the kind of of words that were sung in, in, in hope of the new king or the Messiah coming. And so these words were very pertinent in this particular moment. But there's something else that we must also hold on to. Is that remember I said that the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus. But this time when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem is as if Jesus is coming um, with a death wish. You could almost picture around Jerusalem and, and the cities these wanted signs. Jesus of Nazareth wanted dead or alive. They were out to get him. They, they wanted to kill him. And so Jesus chooses on this, what we call Palm Sunday, to enter into Jerusalem. It's the culmination of his ministry and his life coming together on this particular day. John says later on in his gospel, No greater love has a man than this that he lay down his life for his friends. And I want to remind us today that the choice that Jesus makes is to love. Because you can't go into a situation like this knowing that your life is at stake and that you're going to die if there's not a choice involved. I don't think Jesus wakes up in his humanness and says, it's going to be a great day or a great week to be spat on and to be abused. But there's a choice that he makes because he has been prepared for this. His father has prepared him for this moment. And this is where we're going to get to as we move towards Good Friday. In verse 14 and 15 of John's gospel, he says, Jesus found a young donkey and he sat upon it as it was written. And then do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And I think as many of you would remember, this act of Jesus speaks more than a thousand words could ever say. Because by choosing to ride on a donkey, and in fact on the cult of a donkey, Jesus is publicly showing people that he comes to set up a new kingdom. He's not a king, a warrior king coming to lead the people in battle against the Romans who are oppressing them. If he had done that, he would have come in on a stallion and, and, a, and a horse proclaiming that he was that kind of victorious king. But he comes on a donkey, on the colt of a donkey, to say, I have come as the prince of peace, the king of peace. And it's that action that begins to, to change the thinking of people in that moment. The other word that John uses here from Zechariah is, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. And I think that's a lovely prophetic word for us today, because how many of us sitting watching this are afraid at the moment? Yes, coronavirus is there, and that has its own fear and its own implications. But there are other fears that we may have. As we get older, maybe we fear um, about old age. Some of us fear loneliness. Some of us fear about our careers. Those of you who are at school who are watching, maybe you you're worried about being bullied at school or subject choices or what to study after school. There's all these fears that come up. And the word comes to us today, don't be afraid, O daughter of Zion. Maybe you could just fill in your own name there. Don't be afraid, down, because God is with you. In fact, Deuteronomy 31 says, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified because of them, because of what's out there for the Lord your God goes with you. And so as Jesus rides into Jerusalem that day, he asks the people in a subtle way a question, and he asks us the same question. Will you enthrone me? In other words, will you find a space in your heart and your life so that I can be king, I can be Lord, I can be Savior? The Bible tells us the disciples were actually a bit clueless even in this moment. They didn't quite fully understand what was going on, but they they follow Jesus nonetheless. And in a great twist of irony, John records in verse 19 these words. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, 
This is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after Jesus. They were feeling defeated. They realized something was happening here that they had no control over. And you have to really admire John as an author, um, as he pens together this whole story. If you go back to John chapter 3, which for many of you would remember, John 3 verse 16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That was a word of prophecy that Jesus, uh, in sharing with Nicodemus, spoke about. And now the Pharisees, in a way, have confirmed that. Without even thinking about it, they've said, look, the whole world has gone after him. Sadly, the whole world doesn't follow Christ today. We understand that. But still, the invitation, Jesus' invitation of grace and mercy and to be part of a new kingdom is there for everyone. No matter whether you feel religious, no matter if you feel spiritual, no matter even if you feel holy enough, the invitation is there for you. And so I want to ask us this very pertinent question today, friends. Why is it that we worship Jesus? Why do you worship Jesus? And maybe even if you, you aren't a Christ follower as yet, why have you bothered to, to watch this this morning? There are plenty of other things you could be doing on your lockdown. I'm sure you could be exercising in your garden now or sleeping late or doing whatever you want to do. But what is it that has drawn us to Christ in this moment? I really think that we must ponder this as we journey from today, Palm Sunday, into Good Friday. Why do we worship Christ? Because if we worship him for the wrong reasons, we're going to be disappointed. If we worship him because we think he's a crutch or he's the magic genie, we can, we can get something from him we're only setting ourselves up for disappointment. It reminds me of a story. It's quite a nice story of a lady who was lost um, while she was driving in the pouring rain and she couldn't see where she was going in the road. So she, she managed to see the taillights of the car just in front of her. And quite naturally, she thought, well, if this car is heading in the same direction as me, let me follow that car and I'm sure I'll get to my destination safely. And so she was driving along for a while until suddenly the car in front slammed on brakes. And so she slammed on brakes. She wasn't sure whether they maybe had hit into an animal or hit into a pothole or something like that. And so she became a bit agitated. Maybe even she said a few words that I know you think about or you say when you get overtaken by that taxi or someone else swerves in front of you. And then suddenly she saw the shadow coming towards her and this man coming to the window. And so she wound her window down just slightly so she could say something to him. And she said, what on earth do you think you're doing? And the man said to her the same thing. She said, ma'am, what do you think you're doing? And she said, well, you slammed on brakes. We could have had an accident. Why have you stopped in the middle of nowhere? And the man said to her, ma'am, this is my driveway. This is my house. I live here. I have come here on purpose. What are you doing following me? And you can just imagine how embarrassed the woman felt. She thought that she was going to get home by following the taillights. And for some of those people who were following Jesus, they were following him because they thought he was going to set them free from the Roman oppressors. They followed him because they wanted their own ideas met and their own ideas of God to, to be fulfilled in Jesus. But Jesus comes to show us a different way. And the disappointment of those people we remember in this Holy Week turns very quickly People, as you know, can be very fickle. From Hosanna, Hosanna on the Sunday, to a few days later, crucify, crucify. And so I ask us the same question. What is it about Jesus that draws us to him? Mark Lamberton was once asked this question, what is at stake in our worship? And his answer is this, everything. Everything is at stake in our worship and he carries on to say because worship names for you and I what matters most in our lives worship turns out to be a dangerous act of waking up to God and to the purposes of God in the world and so as we journey on this worship experience towards Easter why is it that you worship God because remember that it's a dangerous act I love that phrase worship is a dangerous act for you and I it's not something we do just because we've got nothing else to do. It's a dangerous act because it awakens us to the true purposes of God. And dare I say, those true purposes 
are not always the reasons why we think God is here for us. And so friends, as we embark upon this, this journey through Holy Week, I want to challenge you and invite you to come with us. We're going to share a very uh, a short meditation each evening this week. Myself and my colleagues from the Fishhook Circuit are going to put together a very brief meditation for us, which will be online. And so if you want to hear a different voice, then come and join us. And we also will have services on Maundy Thursday or Tenebrae and Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And so may God bless you as you journey with Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. And I want to close our time together by sharing a prayer that my friend of mine, John van der Laar, thank you, John, was able to write. And so let us pray together. The King is coming. Our God arrives, clothed in frail human flesh, riding a meek donkey's colt. This is not the first time you have come to us, O God. The history of human affairs is the history of your arrival among us. As creator, purpose giver, liberator, prophet's voice, and priest's desire, the story of each of our lives is the story of your coming to us as a comforter, as a friend, as an example, as a challenger, as the abundant life provider. And so today we praise you. Open our eyes to your presence, Lord. Come to us again, Lord. Hosanna, save us again and be glorified among us, for you are our God. And so friends, as we close our service, I want to encourage you, stay safe, stay sane, and may God bless you and all of us as we journey through Holy Week, albeit under different circumstances. God bless.